Phantom of Venice is the first Nancy Drew game I played as soon as it was released. It's one of my favorite games. The setting is so much fun. It's bright and colorful. I like the music. The story's great. It's got problems, yeah, but I enjoy it so much I can usually overlook its flaws. The story is that Nancy's been upgraded from creepy girl who collects glass eyeballs to international super spy. She's going undercover with the Italian GDIF to catch a masked phantom. I do want to note that they did change the view outside of Nancy's window. It's winter time and the trees are frozen. That's a nice little touch. The first thing you do is pick up Nancy's Italian dictionary, which goes in her inventory. The dictionary is a neat item. You use it on signs and things to get an instant English translation. I wish it was that easy to translate things in real life. I like the dictionary, and my only complaint is that Nancy should be able to use it during the Italian language puzzle towards the end of the game. The opening scene is interesting. It's about 15 seconds of Nancy walking through dark passageways, paired with some great music. Nancy looks around the culprit storeroom when she's trapped inside. Instead of trying to escape, Nancy stops and thinks about how the case got started. Then she wakes up in her bedroom. I really like the scenery in her bedroom with the warm red tones and the beautiful water outside. It's great. You can go to the bathroom where Nancy says weird and funny things like two games ago. We've got a wardrobe for changing Nancy's outfit. I like the dress up feature. I think the wardrobe itself could be improved. It's a little weird that there's a separate drawer just for sunglasses. It's weird that gloves and belts both go in the necklace drawer. I would expect belts to be in the pants drawer. It's also weird there's a necklace drawer to begin with. Nancy can't wear any necklaces in this game. She's wearing a special locket that her boyfriend gave her. Nancy has a makeup bag on top of the wardrobe, and I think they could have made it more obvious that the makeup bag's an item you can interact with. I know some people got stuck here because they thought the makeup bag was just part of the scenery, like the teddy bear or the brush, which are also on the wardrobe, but you can't interact with them. The makeup bag has toiletries and hairpins. You need to get a hairpin here, but you have to try opening the door to Fongo's office before you can get the hairpin. I don't like that limitation. I think you should be able to take the hairpin before Nancy knows she needs one. Nancy can get the cat suit and the bird seed and a magazine before she knows she needs them, but she can't get the hairpin or the sunglasses early. It bugs me a little that the game's inconsistent about which items Nancy can get early and which ones she can't. The top of the screen has a wardrobe icon which shows what Nancy's currently wearing. I wish this icon could be used to change Nancy's clothes at any time, like a portable wardrobe. That way you wouldn't have to go back to the Con Ascosta every time you want to change Nancy's outfit, which is kind of a pain. There's also a coin bag at the top of the screen. The other side of the room belongs to Helena Berg, Nancy's roommate. She's got some postcards in German, which I'm pretty sure is just an excuse to reference the song 99 Luftballons. Next to Helena's bed is the phone. Nancy can use it to call her boyfriend Ned, who's hanging out with Joe Hardy. Joe tinkers with Ned's car and destroys it by accident. It's kind of funny, but I don't usually call Ned for hints because I already know how to beat the game, and manually dialing 13-digit phone numbers is a hassle. The other phone contact is Prudence Rutherford, who automatically calls you if you don't call her. Poor Prudence is confused by caller ID because Nancy's using somebody else's phone. Prudence is pretty funny in this game, although a lot of the jokes involve her being rude to her assistant, which isn't so nice. When I think of Prudence Rutherford, I tend to think of her silly voice from this game, not the one she originally had in Secret of the Scarlet Hand. You leave the bedroom to reach the main room of the Ka. Here you meet Colin Baxter, an Englishman who's repairing the mosaics. Maybe it's just me, but I think Colin is kind of tall, like too tall, and his hair is weird. He loves Venice, but he loves mosaic tiles even more. He forces you to watch a slideshow. He shows off random tiles and gushes over how wonderful they are. What a beauty! Wonderful color! I wish this one was a human so I could marry it! It's super boring, and the game forces you to watch for a fair amount of time before you can back away. And you don't just leave automatically, you get a dialogue box which gives you the option of continuing the slideshow. 
like anyone would want to keep watching. When you say you're done, Colin throws a hissy fit. He also throws a hissy fit if you say you don't want to watch a slideshow in the first place. Colin is really sensitive when it comes to these tiles. I'm not entirely sure what kind of character they wanted Colin to be. Here at the start, he's more of a joke character with weird obsessions. Sometimes he's a sympathetic loser in a bad situation, and there's a touch of him being a legitimate love interest for Nancy, although she's not really interested. Colin complains, Nancy doesn't care about beauty of the soul! She needs faith of the heart! He describes a very valuable statuette that's about 2,000 years old. Rare. It could be worth more than the entire house. So why does Margarita have it lying around on a random table in an unlocked room? At least put a glass container around it or something. The main room of the car is kind of dull colored. There's a desk in the corner where Helena does writing, some chairs that no one ever uses, and a door that's always locked. Colin says there's a parcel for you by the door. Helena says the parcel is in the entryway. They're both wrong. It's on a table outside. I wonder if that dialogue is left over from a time when the Ka had a different design. There certainly should be more to the house. It's supposed to be a good location for spying because it's many stories tall, but all we see are two rooms and a rooftop. That staircase outside is doing some heavy lifting for this property. Nancy goes outside and bumps into Helena. She gets a brief glimpse at Helena's mail, and the two women introduce themselves. Helena's an okay character, but I think she's kind of boring. She's mostly there to give backstory about the Phantom. If she wasn't the culprit, I'd probably forget about her. You can get through the entire game without having to talk to her once. Nancy's parcel is a letter with an ATM card, which is activated at the Piazza San Marco. Also on this table is a newspaper article about the Phantom stealing a chalice. I wish the game had gone into more detail about the Phantom's various thefts. He's stolen four things already, but we don't really hear about them. Whenever you're outside in this game, you can hear people talking in Italian. That is a nice touch, which makes it feel like you're in Italy. You can also move your mouse around on the ground. The cursor turns into a small green arrow, indicating you can click on random garbage. Ah, uh, that seems kind of weird to me. Do people normally go through trash on their Italian vacations? The map system in this game is interesting. You have to click from place to place to get to your destination. There's no real difference between red or black lines, but the blue lines are gondolas. When you take a gondola, you get to hear some Italian singing, along with a randomized slideshow of Venice. I think the developers thought they had to include gondolas somewhere, because that's what Venice is famous for. I mean, I haven't read the book Phantom of Venice, and I can guarantee you there's a gondola inside that book. While the gondolas are okay, they don't affect the gameplay much. I usually avoid them because they cost money. Except for Luigi, he's the gondolier who doesn't charge money or sing. You're a champ, Luigi. If a spot on the map has an eyeball, that means you can visit that location. At Piazza San Marco, there's a pigeon food dispenser. You pay 5 euro for a handful of pigeon food. There's also a kiosk where you can get reference material. It's got a magazine about opening locks, a German dictionary for translating Helena's notes, a chess book, a magazine with Helena's article about the Leo Macchiano trial, and a Chinese reference book. That's a lot of stuff, but most of it is optional. The only thing you have to buy here in order to beat the game is a pair of sunglasses. Nancy puts her card into the ATM for her mission briefing. I love how the ordinary ATM doubles as a secret spy command center. That is so cool. Nancy gets binoculars and a PDA. Her mission is to spy on Antonio Fongo, a suspected criminal who works in the Argon building. Nancy's PDA will beep whenever he's in the office. That happens the next time Nancy returns to the car. You go upstairs to the roof. Nancy talks to Margarita, if she hasn't done so already. Margarita is not a nice person. All she cares about is money and popularity and being tan. It's amazing her skin is not the color of burnt toast, since all she does is lie on the roof. She's fairly rude to Nancy, insulting Nancy's clothes and refusing to loan Nancy any money. She thinks Colin is boring, and Helena is a social climber, so Nancy isn't the only one that Margarita badmouths. 
Use the binoculars on the edge of the roof to spy on Fongo. Margarita will ask what you're doing. You can say you're spying on someone, studying the architecture, or watching birds. I like this conversation option. It doesn't affect anything, but it's always fun to have Nancy blow her cover at the very start of the mission. After a bit, Nancy sees Fongo get a message via Carrier Pigeon. She goes to her room to report this information to her contact, Detective Sophia Leperace. Sophia wants Nancy to break into Fongo's office and feed a tracking device to the pigeon. It's kind of weird they even have pigeon tracking devices, but how else are you going to keep tabs on a pigeon? Sophia emails a picture of the tracking device to Nancy's PDA. I believe that's the only time you use the PDA's mail feature. The PDA has a call button for calling Sophia. You can call her from Nancy's room or the outside stairs. Those don't strike me as secure locations. Nancy's room, she's got a roommate who could walk in at any time. The outside stairs? Somebody could stand in the doorway and easily overhear the conversation. The PDA also has a directions button, which shows four arrows that point to the tracking device. The four arrows also appear on the PDA icon, which is at the bottom of the screen, where Nancy's phone usually is. I just check the arrows on the PDA icon instead of opening the PDA and checking them there. The tracking device is hidden in a costume store in Campo Santa Maria Formosa. It's on the right-hand side of a shoebox. If you're too slow to find it, the device self-destructs and you have to try again. The costume store also has a lot of clothes for fun with dressing up. You break into Fongo's office using a hairpin. This is a variation on the puzzle where you move one item and it moves other items. We've seen that puzzle in multiple games. You click on a tumbler to move it. The goal is to get all the tumblers to the same height, which is the black line on the top of the lock. The puzzle changes every time you play the game, which I think is a nice touch. Fongo's office is kind of neat. It's exactly what I'd expect from a fake electronics office. There's some effort put into making it look real, but it's obvious no real work is done here. There's a fax machine, a musical horse, fake diplomas, and filing cabinets with a lot of random stuff. The pigeon's outside the window. You give it the tracker and birdseed to complete your mission. As Nancy leaves the office, her pager beeps. And I really like this challenge. It's cool and suspenseful. Fongo's about to catch Nancy inside his office. Like the final scene, Nancy has to hide inside a tall cabinet. She doesn't shut the door behind her, which is a terribly dumb mistake on her part. Why would you risk being seen? You don't have to actually look at Fongo to tell whether or not he's in the office. You've got a PDA which tells you that information. Fongo goes right up to Nancy while drinking coffee. It's amazing he doesn't see her. Then he sends a message with the pigeon, and he leaves. Nancy takes note of the poster on the inside of the cabinet. There's a mask and code name for every member of the Phantom Gang. Il Dottore is in the center of the poster, so that person is the ringleader. Nancy is correct, but that is a lot to assume just based on a random poster. Was the poster custom made for the gang? Or did Fongo go through a bunch of Commedia dell'arte merchandise until he found one that has Il Dottore in the middle? Fongo's computer password has a picture of the orange mask, which is Il Capitano. The trash files on his computer indicate he's constantly booking flights out of Italy in case he needs a quick getaway. He also enjoys playing chess with Gina. Nancy uses her PDA to find the pigeon at Campo Santa Margarita. There are dozens of pigeons here, and you have to find the right one. I don't like this challenge at all. How are you supposed to figure it out? It's not like Nancy's got a reference photo of the pigeon, and all the pigeons kind of look the same. The message on the pigeon's leg is, Hello! Sophia says it probably contains a microdot. I have no idea how Fongo is able to make microdots in his office. That probably requires specialized equipment. The game parlor here belongs to Enrico Taza, who fences stolen goods. If you knock on the door, you're dismissed. But no one's guarding the dumpster! Nancy digs through the trash. Gross. She finds random items from previous games, as well as a newspaper clipping about Colin. It says Colin's real name is Justin Beaumont, and he went to prison for stealing a painting. 
I like the Colin fake identity story, but I don't think Enrico's trash was the right place to put it. Why would Enrico have this clipping? He doesn't know who Colin is. There's also a letter which you have to translate with your dictionary. It says an American named Samantha Quick is coming here for a top secret assignment. She has blonde hair, sunglasses, white gloves, and a red dress. Nancy will infiltrate the Phantom Gang by impersonating Samantha Quick. When Nancy returns to the car, she listens in on everyone because they're having a conversation about her. Way to be classy, Nancy. Margarita mentions what Nancy told her earlier, which I think is a nice touch. I like it. Nancy asks Colin if she can use his microscope. He says he normally has a strict policy on microscope usage, but he trusts her. I have no idea what she did to earn his trust, but okay. The microdot says Ildatore wants to change the safe room lock combination to 43556. Nancy and Sophia deduce Ildatore is the ringleader of the gang, and they're staying at the CAW. Sophia wants to plant a bug on all three suspects. Nancy needs to pick them up at the ATM. The bugs don't make much sense to me. Nancy says Helena's always writing, so she wants a bug that fits in Helena's pen. And what, just hope Helena has that particular pen on her when she flees town? Most writers have more than one pen, you know. Nancy puts the bug in the pen while Helena's using the bathroom. That proves Helena doesn't take the pen with her everywhere, but Nancy still thinks it's an accurate bug. Well, <laughs> she's right, you know, at the end of the game, the bug works perfectly! even though Helena is clearly not holding a pen when you confront her. Margarita's bug is a sunglasses case, which is not something you would pack when leaving town in a hurry. Colin's bug is a tessera. What are the odds Colin will not look at the tessera under a microscope and notice the bug? I'd say there's a 0% chance of that happening. I am complaining a lot. I think it's a good idea for Nancy to plant bugs on the suspects. This was a great puzzle. I just think the choice of the bugs was terrible. Around this time, a basket of sausages appears in Nancy's room. They're on Helena's side of the room. I don't know why they're there. Does Colin not know which side is Nancy's? The note says they're from Colin. They look super gross, and they make Nancy so sick, she collapses. Colin doesn't want to admit that he's an idiot who can't tell spoiled food from good food, so he lies and says somebody else got the sausages. Later on, Nancy can get a handwriting sample from Colin's area and prove he gave her the tainted meat. Colin confesses his real name is Justin. He stole a painting because of his love of art. He doesn't want anybody to know about this. Actually, I wonder why he doesn't ask Nancy how she found out. You'd think he'd want to know. Margarita somehow learned that Justin is a criminal. She's blackmailing him into breaking the law during the Mosaic Restoration. If you ask Margarita, she says, no, that's not true. He's the one who wants to break the law, but she refuses to touch his filthy bribe money. Margarita orders Nancy not to tell anyone about this, which basically confirms she's lying. When Nancy disguises herself as Samantha Quick, she's let inside Enrico's game room. Enrico is wearing a mask and a Joker outfit. He always strikes me as vaguely threatening, even though he's being somewhat nice to you. He's the only member of the Phantom Gang that Nancy talks to directly, which makes him stand out a bit more than Fongo or Nico. Enrico never talks business with someone until they beat him at a game of Scopa. He launches into a long explanation of how the game is played. Scopa is fun! I enjoy it a lot. I know some people think it's terrible. I like it. I would play Scopa in real life. Yeah, it takes a while to play, but that doesn't bother me. You can usually finish a game of Scopa in under 10 minutes. The first person to 11 points wins. I'm pretty sure you would have to have amazing luck to win in just one round. My only real complaint is that he does a terrible job of explaining primes. Whoever has the highest number of primes gets a point. Well, what's a prime? I thought it refers to prime numbers. No, actually, uh, you lay down your cards from all four suits. It's the highest number from each particular suit. Hmm, that's, that's interesting. Uh, some people complain that the word Nancy is on the Scopa table, and no, no, I'm pretty sure Nancy didn't write her real name in the Scopa table. That's just a label so you know which side of the table is yours. 
Once you win the game, Enrico says he wants you to steal the Saddle Melek Sapphire at the Palazzo Zatere, guarded by a sophisticated security system. I'm not sure why the gang wants Samantha Quick to steal the Sapphire instead of the Phantom. Maybe because there's a different person buying the Sapphire? Enrico says Gina can find a way past the security. Gina's the person that Fongo plays chess with. So you go to Fongo's office. He shows up at this point to take out a Scopa card from his cabinet. And that happens again on the final day of the game. It makes sense that Fongo needs to get cards. But at the same time, it seems like a waste to have scenes which are just... Fongo goes to his office, gets a card, and leaves immediately. It's like the developers couldn't think of any better spying scenes with Fongo. Gina plays chess using Krollmeister notation. You're supposed to buy the chess book from the kiosk to figure out this puzzle. It assigns letters to every square on the chessboard. Since you're robbing Zatere, you spell out the word Zatere by moving to the Z square, the A square, the T square, and so on. It doesn't matter which piece you move, it only matters where you move the pieces. Once you're done, Gina says she'll leave your information in a bottle by the recycling machine at the Rialto Market tomorrow. Can I just say, putting a glass bottle at a recycling machine is a bad plan? The culprits are lucky nobody recycled it by accident. The market also has a soda machine and a gelato case. You can buy them for money. You can also earn money, buy a bug sprayer here, and use it on the flowers by Margarita. This is 100% the wasp puzzle from the previous game. They just changed the wasps into bees. Thank goodness this puzzle is optional, because I would have a fit if I had to do that puzzle multiple games in a row. Around this time, Nancy gets a threatening phone call from Samantha Quick. Don't ever do that again. There's only one of me. I'd like to keep it that way. This scene is so cool. I love it. I am sure that Samantha wouldn't have been in The Silent Spy if not for this memorable scene. Who is she? It's so mysterious. I don't know who she is, but she's clearly a better detective than Nancy, if she located Nancy so quickly. To skip ahead a day, you click on Nancy's bed, she goes to sleep, and wakes up to another awesome scene. The Phantom breaks into her bed and rips the locket from her neck. Helena screams, and I love how the subtitles say, Helena screams! With an exclamation mark, just to make it look more dramatic! The Phantom jumps off the balcony and disappears into the night without a trace. It is so cool! Okay, so then the game skips ahead to when Nancy's on the phone with Prudence Rutherford. That's not as cool. Prudence says the ancient figurine was stolen, but who cares about that? I want Nancy's locket back. Nancy overhears Colin and Helena, who both accuse each other of leaving the door unlocked. As if the Phantom could not have found a way past the non-existent security system without inside help. Helena accuses Colin of having a crush on Nancy. Then she says, interesting puzzle box, where'd you get it? What a weird change of topic mid-conversation. Colin doesn't respond to her. It's almost like there was more to the conversation, but it was cut from the game for some reason. Colin's puzzle box is on the table. He says he won it in a card game, although he has no idea he won it from the Phantom of Venice. He won't let anyone touch it until it's more convenient to the plot. Nancy's PDA goes off. She spies on Fongo to see him arguing with Margarita. Margarita must have amazing timing as she managed to catch Fongo during the three minutes a day he's actually in the office. The two of them appear to be fighting. She gets mad at him and leaves. Margarita doesn't return until Nancy goes to sleep again. Margarita accuses Nancy of not locking the door to stop the Phantom, and she says she was at Fongo's to order a wireless installation. She found a flyer about it in the trash. She went all the way across the room to grab something out of the trash because it had a coupon attached. Margarita is really obsessed with saving money if she's stealing Helena's trash just for extra coupons. Gina dropped off a bottle, like she said. Inside is a keycard hacking device and a microdot message. When you try to use Colin's microscope to read it, the bulb burns out. Colin is furious about this. How could you do that, Nancy? Something so vital to my work! How could you be so careless? <laughs> uh, that was kind of scary. Colin says he'll get a replacement bulb if you do some mosaic work for him. 
You have to put the tiles in the mosaic one by one, making sure to follow the photo reference. I hate this puzzle. It is long and boring. I wish Junior Mode had an easier variation where you only do it twice instead of four times. Luckily, you don't have to get it perfect, but it's still a terrible puzzle. Maybe not fox and geese terrible, but it's not at all fun to play. Really drags down the game. You do it four times and you get a look at the finished mosaic, which is admittedly rather pretty. Now you can read the microdot. It has a password and says you must get an anti-thermal suit from Club Michio, which is at Campo San Paolo. This is one of the weirder challenges of the game. Nancy puts on a skin-tight cat suit so she can dance in front of cheering strangers. It's all G-rated, but it has some very uncomfortable adult undertones. I don't know who thought it would be a good idea to include this in the game. Seriously, Nancy's wearing hot black leather and dancing around. I don't, uh, well, the good part about this challenge is the music. It is fantastic. Great dance music. It will appear in multiple games after this one. That's how great it is. There are six different dance moves that you can perform. You click a button to perform the move. You want to follow the audio cues as well as the lighting cues. Do it well enough to get the cat suit. You can do this challenge as many times as you want, and you get paid depending on how well you do. I like the voice of the guy. If you're here for the dance audition, Nancy, that's a boring name. I'm going to call you Punchy. Punchy LaRue. I'm annoyed that Nancy has to go back to the car to change into her cat suit. Why can't she change here? She changed her clothes just now to do the audition. Clearly there's some kind of changing room in this building. When you go back to the car, a vase falls off the roof and almost hits you. You have to back away to avoid it. We had this puzzle in previous games. I think this is the first game to introduce good news, bad news jokes whenever there's a game over sequence. Those are funny and they're pretty popular with players. I like them. Future games will just have a black screen for the good news, bad news. This game has a decorative border for each death. So with the pot death, there are pots and flowers on the border. Uh, the robot death has robots on the border, so, and so on. It, it's a nice touch. Nancy puts on her cat suit and goes to the Palazzo Zatere. She uses her keycard on the door and presses the six symbols in the order indicated by the microdot. This starts the robot challenge, which I kind of like and I kind of hate. Like the Tesserae challenge, I think it goes on for too long, which takes away from the enjoyment. There are robots going around a maze. You need to navigate the maze while staying out of the robot's line of sight. If a robot catches you, you're sent back to the start of the room. Sometimes the timing is really hard to get. I tend to get super stuck in the upper left room and the middle room. Dodging robots there is too tough. I like the design of this area, and it's a decent maze. Each of the four corner rooms has a laser you must deactivate. You go up to the laser, and then you pull all eight rods in the correct order. The correct order is randomly determined. You have to do a lot of guessing to figure it out. Since you have to do this four times in a row, I think it's a bit too much. I would have made it so you have to get six correct, not eight. Or I would have added a junior mode variation, which is easier. Once you deactivate all four lasers, you get the sapphire from the middle room. Now you can leave. Disguise yourself as Samantha Quick and give the sapphire to Enrico. The conversation is interrupted by Nico, who's the Phantom. I'm not sure why Enrico doesn't use Nico's code name here. He refers to the other gang members by their code names in this very conversation, just not Nico. Nico's lost the puzzle box, which has the next target inside. That would be Colin's puzzle box. Good thing he lost it to Nancy's roommate, and good thing Helena didn't recognize it. Enrico challenges you to another game of Scopa. You don't have to do this in order to beat the game. When you win, he says the money will be deposited into Samantha's account. I'm sure Samantha Quick is glad about that. Colin is no longer at the car. Margarita complains he left her with a huge bill for the restoration, then fled town. He left Nancy a somewhat sad goodbye note, where he says meeting her was a joy, and he's sorry he couldn't be honest with her. He left her the puzzle box on his desk. Nancy opens the lid for a puzzle. You're supposed to buy a book on Chinese symbols from the kiosk. That explains the puzzle. We've got nine pictures. You want to press the pictures for wood, mountain, fire, and water. Inside is a paper which says what the various Scopa cards represent. You cross-reference this information with the card that Fongo took from his office to determine tonight's target is the Palazzo Orpello. 
There is another puzzle at Fongo's. You enter the number from Fongo's flyer into the fax machine. This gives you a printout that assigns musical notes to numbers. You combine this with the musical notes from the Carousel Horse music box. That gives you the code 291 pound star 991 star 701211002699 star pound 91. Is it just me or is that passcode way too much to remember? You enter that on the phone for an automated directory. It's kind of weird the culprits have a phone line dedicated to explaining how their criminal enterprise is laid out. Nancy should really tell Sophia about this, but she doesn't. You can listen to the whole thing if you want, but the important branch of the phone tree is the one that says they store goods in the safe house behind the fountain at Campo Santa Maria Formosa. That's the purpose of this puzzle. I'm surprised they didn't think up a different puzzle or a different way for Nancy to discover where the safe house is. Nancy calls Sophia, who arranges a stakeout to catch the Phantom. She insists on having Nancy lead the stakeout, even though in real life the police would say, Thank you very much, we'll take it from here. When Nancy says Colin left town, Sophia dismisses this information, saying, Oh, we'll worry about Colin later. I always thought that was weird. Why would she not care about a suspect leaving town right when we learned he's in contact with the Phantom? It's almost like Sophia doesn't care about Colin because she knows he's not the culprit. You have to read the book in Nancy's room. It's called An Interactive Guide to Venice. It's cute that her interactive put the word interactive in the game. The book has a bunch of historical and educational information that I normally skip over. The end of the book has common Italian words. Call Sophia to start the stakeout. There are 11 hiding spots here, such as the red flowers or the doorway, and now that I'm looking at it carefully, they messed up the book that's supposed to prepare you for this puzzle. Three hiding spots that aren't in the book are gondolas, automobile, and l'ombrella. Two things in the book which aren't in the puzzle are banco, which is bench, and trelicio, which is trellis. It's like they changed the layout of the puzzle, but they forgot to change the book accordingly. The four agents say their locations, and they crawl out. You want to click on the shadow that doesn't belong to one of the four agents. You have to do this multiple times in order to capture Nico. Nico is finally arrested, but the game doesn't end there. I like how the game continues with 20 minutes of puzzles after the Phantom is captured. This puzzle could have been the big finale to the game. That could have worked. Nico refuses to confess anything to the police. The only thing on his person is a propane receipt, which reads 3447. Nancy goes to Enrico's and uses that number to open the propane tank. Inside is a key to the safe house. In junior mode, you also find a map for the terrible, terrible sewer puzzle. I don't like it at all. It's far too easy to get lost in a sewer maze because all the places look the exact same. The puzzle would be improved if we had a useful map. A map that says where you are at all times, like the map for the revolving rooms in Curse of Blackmore Manor. It'd also be better if there was something to prepare players for this puzzle. Like what if, in order to open Colin's puzzle box, we had an easier version of this puzzle? One that's two levels tall instead of three? That way players could get a sense for how the puzzle works, because honestly it's pretty tough just to figure out the rules for the puzzle. Does the triangle drain circle, or does circle drain triangle? The, the rules are not intuitive. I think it might be an okay puzzle if you could see it from the outside. That is, if you got to see all three towers and how they're interconnected all at once. But you have to solve the puzzle while inside the towers, and that extra layer of difficulty is too much. The junior mode map barely helps. It indicates the ten places you must perform an action, it doesn't say whether you're draining or filling, and it doesn't say which well you perform the action on. I've definitely gotten stuck while trying to follow the junior mode map. It's definitely not a good puzzle. Pretty much everyone has trouble with it, even if you figured out how the puzzle works. It's still pretty tough to do. The sewer puzzle ends at a ladder. Nancy climbs it to reach a dark tunnel. Take the flashlight from the left and use it to get through. This is a scene from the start of the game. It's cool to finally catch up to the start. Nancy opens the safe room door with a password from the first microdot. She goes forward and sees a crate with a stolen figurine hidden inside. Nancy recognizes the address from Helena's mail, which means Helena's the culprit! 
and maybe Helena's here, because someone shuts the door on Nancy and tries to kill her by flooding the room. Or maybe Nancy tripped some automatic security system by accident? I don't know. To escape, Nancy has to set five water gauges to the same level. If you take too long, or if one thing hits the top line, you lose the puzzle. This is a variation on the when you move one item, it moves other items puzzle, which we saw earlier with the door to Fongo's office. I do like this variation on the puzzle, because you have the ability to either raise or lower a gauge. That makes it different enough from uh, the door puzzle, so it doesn't feel like they're reusing puzzles in the game. The exit opens up when you solve the puzzle. Nancy climbs up a rope ladder. She calls Sophia, who sets up the final puzzle of the game. Like Secret of the Old Clock and Trail of the Twister, you have to navigate the game's map system to stop the culprit. Nancy's PDA will say what transportation Helena's using. It occasionally says where she is. This usually turns into a big guessing game. Most of the places on the map have multiple connections of the same type, so knowing Helena used a gondola doesn't always narrow things down. It is a fast-paced puzzle, which is appropriate for the situation. Nancy comes across Helena, who's trying to hide in an alleyway. Nice try, Helena. She's wearing Nancy's locket in public, which is a weird decision. If anyone else at the car sees her with that locket, they're gonna be suspicious. I like the confrontation with Helena. She's pretty nasty, and honestly, she shows more personality in this minute than she does for the entire rest of the game. Helena says, it's not over, not by a long shot. That's so specific, it makes me think they plan to bring her back as the culprit in a future game. Maybe having Helena as the culprit in Ransom of the Seven Ships would have improved that game. I like the mugshot of Helena. I'm not a big fan of the ending. The ending's mostly an explanation of who's in the Phantom Gang and how they operated. I don't think they quite needed that. It's mostly just repeating information from the phone tree. It's still nice to have. The pictures that accompany the descriptions are quite nice. I find it interesting that Gina is treated on par with all the other culprits when she's the least involved member of the gang. The only one we never met in person. Also, no mention of Samantha Quick, huh? Prudence promises to mention Nancy in her memoirs. Great, now Nancy has to read that book. Margarita gets a happy ending, as she's now one of the most popular people in Venice. It's a little odd that she gets a good ending, considering how nasty of a person she is. Colin has a sad ending, where he calls Nancy out of the blue to ask if she's still dating Ned. That's kind of stalker-like, to be honest. When Nancy says she still has Ned's locket, Colin hangs up and never contacts her again. There's a shadow of a person in the corner of that picture with Colin, some people think, well, Samantha Quick is there. Maybe Colin asked her to get him Nancy's home phone number. Or maybe they know each other somehow? That's how she found out so much about Nancy in such a short amount of time? In Ransom of the Seven Ships, one of the things Cuckoo says is, Samantha, this is Justin. Which leads credence to the theory that Samantha knows Colin. Sadly, this idea is not explored in later games, so who knows? Who knows if Colin actually knows Samantha Quick? Nancy feels bad for Colin until she remembers how awful his mosaic obsession is, and we get a mosaic to finish the game. This is the first game with outtakes after the ending credits. They're okay, it's a nice surprise. I've seen them enough times that they no longer amuse me. Seeing the fake horror movie with a giant pigeon is funny. Seeing a wheel fall down is not funny to me, no. Overall, I enjoy this game. It's got a great setting and good puzzles. The characters could be improved, but the storyline of being a spy is great. The things that drag the game down are the Tesserae puzzle and the Sewers puzzle, but it is still one of my all-time Nancy Drew favorites. I give Nancy Drew number 18, The Phantom of Venice, a 9 out of 10.